I am Dave of Dave Skinks, and we have a very special video for you today going over a brand new species of blue tongue, the ultra rare and coveted Taliqua multifaciata, also known as the Centralian blue tongue skink. I'm going to be talking a lot about what they're like as a lizard, their needs in captivity, but first I'm going to briefly touch on how I came about this lovely uh, female here. Uh, she was given to a Hong Kong supplier who would sell her on the open market and she was legally imported to Canada because Canada has different laws about the movement of Australian native species. So she was able to legally be bought from Hong Kong and shipped to Canada and then the Canadian supplier uh, strategically uh, did not care for her, gave her improper temperatures, just didn't feed her at all. Uh, she developed a very severe respiratory infection and was just sort of withering away uh, when he decided to sell her to me and I was completely unaware about uh, the lack of care that I'm uh, being treated with. And so I actually bought a breeding couple, a male and a female. Uh, she was bigger than the male. Um, the male arrived to me pretty much on death's doorstep and I, I got them both to a specialty vet who was familiar with the species and how to treat respiratory infections and other issues that uh, they were dealing with. She had a broken hand. He was just coated in bacteria both on the skin surface and internally. We tried everything to save him. Uh, he unfortunately passed away about 10 days into my care. She, had, on the other hand, has made a, a huge turnaround, a big improvement. She has been putting on weight. Uh, the original male arrived as a full adult at 137 grams. That's pretty much the same as another uh, species of blue tongue, uh, just as like a baby as a newborn. She started at 225 grams, which is a little bit better, uh, still a little small. She's now up to 260 grams, and so I'm, I'm proud of that, but we are gonna try to continue feeding her and beefing her up. And I, I don't wanna go on such a negative rant and bad-mouthing the Canadian uh, supplier for his strategic uh, treatment or lack thereof with this lizard. You can read all about that on my main website's blog post. That's really where I unleash hell on this guy uh, for the very unethical treatment of this, this beautiful creature. Uh, but now she's in my care. Uh, all it took to get one of these, or, or two in my case, uh, was, was my life savings. Uh, I had to give up my social security number, my mother's maiden name, her bank account numbers, and a slew of other things. Uh, so we, we, we might not be going down that road again. And that's uh, all joking aside. Uh, but because of their rarity, they are ultra expensive. So enough with that rant. I want to sort of talk about the cool factor of the species. So it's different than most of the other blue tongues. It's one of two desert species. It's native to Australia. And though it's uncommonly kept, it actually has the most wide and diverse uh, geographic region in all of Australia. All the other blue tongue species are kept to a segment or hub of Australia, and these guys dominate the entire center of Australia, where it is incredibly hot and dry and just arid. They live off of the red soil, and the soil is red from oxidized particles, uh, something that I'm not really able to acquire here. Uh, in the US. So we've got her on a totally different housing setup, which we will show you here in a minute. A few things that are really cool about them. First, the physical characteristics. As you can see, her tongue has been doing this flickering motion up and down. They are the only species, including the other desert, the, the western species, that does this. Uh, the centrillions are just really adorable in that fashion. They have these dark black sidebands, which is used to uh, sort of deflect the, the bright sun that is coming down on them. And because they live in the center of Australia, uh, that's a bit more rocky and sandy, uh, they're not much burrowers. They like to hide in the bush and in the grasses. And so we have her enclosure set up to mimic that, which is, again, very different than what we do with the other species of blue tongue we keep here. They are known for uh, having a continuation of these dark bandings on the tops of their front arms while they have stripes on the back of their arms. 
their bodies are often uh, a lot more red. Uh, she's got some good red tones, but they can be like real solid red with almost like a golden head. They also feature uh, this crest right here in the center. Uh, that's something indicative of all of them uh, to sort of help identify if you have a, a true Centralian um, or, or maybe a hybrid or something else. Uh, that's one thing that's also indicative of this species alone. When I realized I was getting these blue tongues, the very first thing I did was hit up Joe Ball. He is a Brit living in Australia. He is the absolute biggest and best uh, blue tongue breeder and keeper, uh, I think, on the planet. Maybe that opinion is a little subjective, but I'm not afraid to boast about him. Uh, so the first thing I did is I hit him up, and he goes, Mate, uh, I don't keep them. I barely know anyone who keeps them. They are a challenging lizard to keep and breed successfully. But he was able to hook me up with, with one person. That guy's name is Scott Ryan out of Australia. He then connected me with uh, Kenneth Anberg, who is over in Europe, who is breeding these. And I was able to also connect with Robert Walters, who is a U.S. breeder. He does not keep uh, Centralians. But he was able to lend me this book right here. It's probably the, the, the absolute best book for any blue tongue keeper or enthusiast to have. So I really want to thank all three of those guys for helping provide the knowledge that allows me to care for this lizard better in captivity. Um, so I, like I said, they're, they're a desert species. They like it crazy dry and hot. So she has a, a basking temperature that'll range anywhere from 110 to 140 degrees, and she has no cool side. Ambient temperature is real key uh, to their happiness in captivity. So she's got heat pads on both the hot and the cool side. When I say cool, I mean we're talking about 90 degrees here Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's the way she likes it. In the evening, uh, when all the lights go down, it's okay to drop her to room temperature, uh, which is about 70 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit here. But I still keep the heat pads going because she needs a little bit more heat at all times. Because they like it so hot, dry, and arid, they really don't interact with water all that much. They certainly drink water, uh, but not like any other blue tongue, certainly not like the Indonesians that need closer to 100% humidity. So she's got a much smaller water bowl, and most of the blue tongues will walk through the water. It gives their body a little bath. She will definitely not do that, so it makes her a little bit stinkier. Uh, I would say she is the smelliest of all the blue tongues because they don't really bathe. Um, but that's okay. She's still got a real adorable factor going on for her. Uh, they also have a fairly different diet. It's a mix between high protein from live insects, dubia roaches, earthworms, uh, waxworms, mealworms, java worms, uh, butterworms even. Uh, just a lot of different types of live insects is their main protein. She really is not a fan of uh, wet cat food uh, or wet dog food. She will nibble on uh, dry dog food. But because she had such a different life in China and then no life in Canada and now me, I'm having a little bit of a tricky time getting her to eat. So I've gotten her to put on a little bit of weight, but there's a few things made by the Rapashi company that I'm, I'm interested in trying to see if uh, we can get her to, to beef up some of that weight to a more healthy size. Uh, in addition to the protein, they'll also eat a lot of fruit. I've given her entire meals of fruit and her poops come out solid. If you try to do that with just about any other blue tongue species, it's going to be like just liquid sugar to them. And they're going to have these, these runny, non-solid poops. And it's, it's not real healthy for them. It's more or less a treat. But she can eat fruit all day. Uh, fruit, eggs, and live insects are, are the main bulk of their diet. Not so much on the veggies or the greens. Um, flowers are okay too, but uh, it's winter here in Chicago, so I haven't had a chance to be able to try that yet. So their size in the wild, according to the Bluey Bible over there, is roughly two-thirds the size of the northern. Another species I also keep uh, in the wild, they're recognized as the largest of all the blue tongue species. Uh, they can be a thousand grams or more, uh, 24 inches or more. They can be smaller too, and that is okay. 
uh, especially here in the U.S. where we have limited genetics. But in the wild, these are observed to be about two-thirds the size of that. Her being 260 grams is real tiny. And her former boyfriend coming in at 137 grams is just outright dangerous and inappropriate. And so it's a real sad story, but I'm just trying to do what's right by her. And hopefully this will be a learning experience for anyone else who's thinking about getting into these species. Hi, honey. Am I playing with you too much? So I might be playing with her uh, a little too much. I see her doing a little, little foaming in the mouth. She might have uh, also eaten something earlier. Um, let's also calm down. I'm going to try to put her down because I want to minimize stress. Something that's crazy about this species is their lower immune systems, they do not respond well to like any stress. They don't bounce back. Uh, temperature fluctuations, moving different homes, uh, humidity changes, it can just crash these guys into just coming down with the flu, a cold, a respiratory infection, a bacterial infection. Uh, shipping these is a little bit more dangerous than any other reptile. You can do everything right and there's just a better chance that, that something can go wrong. Of course, if you're not caring for the reptile at all for a few months, uh, things will just go south real fast. Uh, so I've, I've had to give her a number of rounds of injectable antibiotics, um, some orally, and that's, that's really helped her bounce back, including uh, carnivore care. I want to thank uh, Alex Lackey from Blazing Blue Tongues for turning on to carnivore care. Uh, it's like a high protein diet to sort of rescue animals, including lizards that are close to death's doorstep, especially young babies who are, are a little too weak for survival. It can really help uh, revitalize their wellness and just, just bounce back a lot better than they could otherwise. And I think those are some of the factors why she was able to make a real solid recovery now. But we're not out of the woods yet. Their enclosure, I keep between zero and 20% humidity. I really try not to go above that. Sometimes your tank gets to about 25% humidity. If you're somebody who's trying to keep these closer to about 40% humidity, which is still potentially in the okay range, uh, it, it, it can cause a new respiratory infection. So you gotta just increase the heat and increase the dryness, uh, and their body will self-correct. Uh, from that type of, of, of infection, but should it be prolonged, going on months or even years, uh, it's really debilitating and a lot trickier for them to make a comeback from. Uh, so I think I've done a, a good job of sort of highlighting the species and, and how I came about her. Uh, so let's take a look inside the enclosure and see what I have going on. All right, so we've got her back in her enclosure, which is set up, again, very differently than any of the other blue tongue species I keep. Uh, if you didn't know, I keep the Northern Australians, Taliqua Skinkoides Intermedia. I also keep the Irangias from Indonesia, Taliqua SP. Uh, SP is short for species because scientists haven't gotten off their butts and given the Irangias a formal uh, definitive recognition yet. But again, we're just going to focus on the Taliqua multifasciata, our centrillion blue tongue skink from Australia. So in the wild, she is used to being on this red earth, this sort of rocky sand, oxidized uh, substrate, which she would not burrow in. She'll dig a little bit, but she'll mostly hide. And so here in the U.S. and in captivity, I have sort of flipped it. I have given her a green, uh, grassy substrate. This is something that is, is commonly done with a few other uh, captive keepers. It's really just a nice turf, and it's, it's deep enough for her to bury her hands. But then I have these, these autumn leaf fake vines, bright red, for her to sort of feel comfortable camouflaging behind. And she'll go hide in there. She'll hide underneath the bricks, under her log. Even I've got some, some mossy, dry mossy stuff on the far right, the cool side. Uh, but that's what she likes to do. She'll, she'll go hide and then she'll come out and nap under the sun. And she constantly does that. She'll move a little bit around the tank and she'll nap. That's sort of her personality. I've got a lot of scattered bricks throughout the tank. It's great for her nail maintenance. This system is working out pretty well. She's got a rather small water bowl compared to the others, because like I said, we want to keep the humidity real low, between 0 and 
the lights I'm using are a 100 watt Zoom Ed Mercury Vapor Bulb. It provides great UVA and UVB, uh, which your body absorbs and helps uh, to produce energy, uh, turn calcium and vitamin D into a, a sufficient source of energy for her. Uh, it keeps her bones, her skin, and her immune system healthy. Uh, she's in a 48, no, it's a 40, 45 inch by 24 inch enclosure. So almost a 75 gallon. She's got roughly a thousand square inches of floor space, and that's pretty good for her. Uh, she can live together with other Centralian Blue Tongue, but my whole plan is to try to breed these, produce more captive bred Centralian Blue Tongue skinks into this world, should I be fortunate enough to get my hands on another male. Uh, but during breeding time, or when the female is pregnant, you want to separate them. There needs to be a very light rumination cycle. Uh, with her, it's a very, very gradual change. Uh, I'll lower temperatures over several months, keep them low for only a few weeks, and take a few more months to bring the temperatures back up to her hot summer cycle. And that's what's going to take to get them to breed. Ambient temperature is huge, so as I had said earlier, we have underbelly heat mats on both the hot and the cool side, different areas from the light on the hot side, because uh, that's what their species likes, uh, just really hot, arid, and dry, and we're able to accomplish everything she needs here. And I feel real proud of that. And if anyone is more experienced in the species than I am, I would love to connect with you so I can learn more about them. And if you have any questions, I want to hear from you. Thanks for checking out my video.